Great. So good evening, everyone. My name is Karen Collins. I am one of the college counselors from the Center for College Planning. And tonight we are gonna be talking about applying to college. So we have lots of information to share with you, but first I wanna introduce my friend and colleague, Michelle. So she's gonna introduce herself as well. Hi there, everybody. My name's Michelle Lavelle, and I'm the director and a co-founder of Granite State Home Educators. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to partner with Karen and Neef to offer these events to the homeschool community. It's really been a fun and really wonderful partnership as we've this, I think it's like our maybe third virtual event and we did some live ones before all that. So we've got a good thing going here to provide a lot of great uh, college counseling type information to the homeschool community that I think was a piece missing for a lot of our high school students. So I think this has been a great opportunity to provide helpful information to the families as they consider this, all this, you know, what does post-secondary look like for our kids? What are we looking at? And what, how do we even explore those options? So I'm really glad that you can be a part of this discussion, everybody. And uh, Karen, thank you. It's been really a lot of fun working with you. Been great. So what we're going to do is I am going to share my screen with you. Um, so we do have a PowerPoint here that we are going to be able to share with everybody. And let me find it here. There we go. And let's go from the beginning. There we go. Um, you'll notice on your screen, if you kind of hover down around the bottom of your screen, you're gonna see a chat feature. Feel free to use that chat. If you have questions, if you have thoughts, you wanna share something with us, um, definitely go and use that chat. Michelle's gonna be kind of keeping an eye on that and we're gonna stop. I'm gonna try to remember to pause every once in a while <laughs> and make sure we can answer those questions. If not, she's gonna, give me a knock and say, hey, don't forget, we're gonna answer some questions now, um, but we wanna make sure that we're, we're kind of covering all the things that you wanna cover, getting all those questions answered um, as we move along tonight. So we are gonna be talking about applying to college, um, but first what I wanna do is I wanna tell you a little bit about our Center for College Planning. So we are an organization, we're a nonprofit organization um, located in Concord, New Hampshire. Right now I'm located in Londonderry, New Hampshire from home. Um, we are all virtual right now. We have been since last March. Um, so we will continue to be virtual um, and work with families um, through Zoom and through um, you know, the internet as much as we can until at least Labor Day. Um, hopefully after that we can be live and back in person with all of our families. But here are some of the things that um, are kind of a, almost a timeline of, of some stuff that we can help you with as you get working through this whole college planning process. So the first thing that you see up there is the college planning and financial aid presentations. These are just like what we're doing right now. We have been, as Michelle mentioned, virtual for the last couple of them, but we also do these live once we can be live again. We will be back on our NEAF campus and invite you all to join us there um, for different panel discussions, talking about college planning, financial aid, writing your essay, uh, getting transcripts put together, all of those types of things. Um, we also do college counseling appointments. So we start meeting with juniors in high school. Actually, very soon, we're gonna be starting May 1st to meet with juniors, one-on-one -on -one appointments. Again, right now they're through Zoom. Um, but they work really well, and we can kind of help you through this college process. So if you have thoughts about, you know, how do I put my list of schools together, or how do I find schools that offer me the most financial aid, or how do I think about um, how many schools should I apply to? Some of the things we'll talk about tonight, if you want to kind of meet one-on-one -on -one and talk about those things, we are very happy to do that. You can just give us a call. You can see all of our information at the bottom of the slides as we work our way through the whole evening. So definitely jot that down and just give us a call and we can set those up for you. We also this summer will have a college boot camp summer series. So that's going to consist of a couple different things. One of the things is going to be that actual boot camp for students, for, for rising seniors, to really help them to write that college essay, get started in that process. They come in, well, they'll zoom in um, <laughs> and meet with one of our counselors, Angela, who is amazing. And she will kind of talk about the ins and the outs of writing that college essay. Then she gives them a little bit of time to really brainstorm and start thinking about what topic might make sense for them. 
Then they go and they meet with a college representative from one of our schools here in the state. Um, that representative will kind of give that student a sense of, yep, you're on the right pathway. Or how about if you narrow down your topic just a little bit, because that's a lot to talk about. Or maybe you need to broaden that out a little bit to give us a little more information. Um, then they'll be shooed away again. Um, they'll work on that essay a little bit more, and then they'll come back and meet with a college representative again once they've really started that writing to give them a sense of kind of, you know, how things are going and, and you know, where they are in that process. So that's really great. The other part of the summer series um, is going to be a bunch of webinars that we're going to offer for parents. So everything from, you know, applying to college to writing a college essay to financial aid, um, financial aid is changing fairly significantly over the next couple of years. So we're going to, once we have all the details of that um, this summer, we're going to start sharing that with our families as well. Um, so there will be a lot of information um, for families in a webinar format that you can listen to from home, just like you're doing tonight. So um, stay tuned for that information. And I'll make sure that Michelle has all of that so that she can kind of let you guys know what's happening. Um, then kind of the next piece of the process is going to be when you are actually applying for financial aid, um, you're going to be filling out what's called the FAFSA form or the free application for federal student aid. We actually file those with families. So families can sit with us again through Zoom right now. Um, we will help them to complete that federal financial aid form and get that sent off to their colleges in that um, free appointment. So um, it's a not exciting necessarily one, but it is exciting when we're done with filing that FAFSA and getting all that information out to the schools for you. And then a little bit after that, once that FAFSA has been filed and the schools have responded to your student and offered them um, an award um, from their school, that's when we kind of sit with families in a funding options appointment and talk about, okay, so what does this mean? You know, what did these different schools offer to you? What is this school compared to that school? Did this school give you more need-based aid? Did this school give you more, you know, gift aid? How did that work? And then we can talk about um, how do we fund that education? You know, how do we fill that gap? And what are some of the best strategies um, for your family? It's, it's different from family to family, of course, and we can run some numbers and and uh, let you know, if I borrowed this much, how much would that look like in a payment over the next 10 years? We can run all of those numbers with families and kind of get you started um, in that funding process. So these are some of the things um, that the Center for College Planning is offering. Um, everything that we do is free. So that price is right. We definitely want you to take advantage of the places that are offering this free assistance. You definitely don't need to pay anybody to help you with this. You certainly can if you wish to, but you don't need to. There are plenty of folks here in the state that really want to help you and really want to guide you through this process. So, you know, feel free to give us a call in the Center for College Planning at any time and, and we'll do our best to, to uh, help you. And if we can't, we probably know the person who can. not So we'll point you in the right direction for sure. Another thing to notice here on this slide is that um, there are PDF versions of this presentation as well as our handouts um, at our neef.org website. Just go under um, students and parents and you'll notice that there are handouts so you can um, follow along, get more information um, and check things out as we kind of move along in the process. So now to the task at hand. Let's talk a little bit about um, searching for colleges. How do we think about finding fit? You know, you hear that so much in this process, you know, what is the right fit for me or for my student? How do we know which school that's going to be? And I think that puts a lot of pressure on our students to find that one school that is going to be that fit. I think one of the things that we first have to talk about is that there are over 4,000 colleges in the United States alone. And of those 4,000 colleges, there are gonna be a lot of schools that are going to fit well. Um, with your students' personality, with your students' desires, with your students' um, you know, major, all those things that they're looking for. Um, so don't focus just on one, finding that one school. Let's find some schools that are going to kind of be that fit and then go through this admission process, the financial aid process, and see which one is going to fit um, in the finances department as well. So 
how do we find this fit? So there are a couple things up on that screen that we definitely always talk about in terms of, um, you know, narrowing down that list from 4,000 to a much more reasonable number of schools that we can be looking at. Um, certainly things like location and size make a difference. You know, do you want to be at a school that is thousands of miles away from home and you're going to need to get on an airplane to come home for, you know, for your breaks. And that might be the only time that you're getting home is on break because to get there for the weekend might be too expensive or just too time consuming for the family. Um, size is important. Um, I think also think about not just size of the campus, how large is the actual campus, but classroom sizes as well. Sometimes some of the biggest campuses you can find have really small class sizes. Um, so it's important to kind of consider all of those factors and what is your learning style? You know, are you a student that, because you're not sitting in a classroom right now, you might be a classroom of one, um, you might be a classroom with just your siblings. Um, what would that feel like to be in an auditorium with 500 students and, and maybe even watching, you know, a video of your professor and getting the lecture that way? Or would you be more comfortable with a smaller um, classroom with maybe you know, 20 students, sometimes even 10 students at, at different colleges? So check those things out, ask questions about that when you're visiting schools and, and don't settle for just the statistics, you know, kind of ask a little bit more deep questions you know, of your tour guide or, or of whoever you're meeting with and just say, you know, so once I get into my major, how big are those classes when you are sitting in your engineering class? How many other students are in there? You know, ask those really pointed questions so that you get things answered pretty well. Internships and co-ops. This used to be something that, you know, I would say, <clears throat> excuse me, ask if the college has them. Now the colleges are going to have them. Um, I would say this is something that we ask if there is somebody there who might help a student to set up an internship or a co-op where they have the opportunity to get that work experience that will be necessary when they're applying for their jobs. Parents, internships and co-ops are great. It's where they you know, go into the um, working world and they work alongside of colleagues in the field and they learn from them and, and they sometimes are paid and sometimes they're not. Um, but a lot of times this is where they get their first job. So we like internships and co-ops for that reason as well. Um, but ask the questions of, you know, is there somebody that can help our student to set that up? Do internships, do students get paid for internships at this school or do we pay for our students to do internships? Because a lot of times if your student is getting credits for that internship, you're actually gonna pay for those credits at the college. So. I've definitely seen that happen. Um, you know, I my daughter went through an education program and we paid while she student taught. So, you know, ask those questions, find out how that works at, at your schools that you're interested in, but you definitely want to have those internships and co-ops available. Majors and special programs are also a definite way to really narrow down that list, especially if you have a really specific major, something like physical therapy or nursing or engineering, where you know those are not at every single college, you know, those aren't necessarily available or they're very small um, classes that they admit to those particular programs. Those can help narrow down your choices as well. Some of you may not know what your major is going to be and that is okay. You know, you wanna find a liberal arts college that has a bunch of different majors that you think you might be interested in. You have time to explore once you're there. Um, you have time to explore between now and getting there as well. So. Um, it's a way to start to narrow them down, but do not panic if you don't have that nailed down just yet. So many students change their majors anyway. Um, so, you know, it's not the only way to narrow down those lists of colleges. Um, how do you then kind of go about actually physically doing that? Um, I use search engines like Big Future um, and petersons.org. These are um, college search engines where you can put in information like I would like to be in New England. I would like a college with 5,000 students or less. I want to major in chemistry and I want there to be a marching band. Um, you can put in these specifics and it will give you the list of colleges that fit that particular criteria. You can widen it out. You can narrow it down. You can play a million times with it, um, but it's a great way for students to really get started putting together a list of schools 
no matter what their year in high school happens to be, you know, they can really start to think about this. Um, it's never too early. You know, you might be visiting relatives in another state and there happens to be a school close by, drive through, check it out, see what does it look like? Is it too big? Is it too small? Is it too much in the city? Is it not enough in the city? You know, it just gives you a really good sense of, um, you know, what a student may be looking for. They change their minds in this process. They grow over this search process. They think they might want one thing and then they might change their mind and realize that they need another thing out of a college. So that is totally okay. Um, but you need time to be able to make that switch and, and start looking at those other schools as well. There are some other things that families can consider in this process as well. Things like um, accelerated programs, things like bachelor's to master's, where students can potentially complete their bachelor's degree, maybe in three or even four years sometimes, and then an additional year for their master's. There are three plus two programs, three plus three, three plus four programs, um, depending on their medical programs, um, sometimes uh, law programs as well. So there's a lot of combined programs that can save students some years, which translates to save some money um, on those college campuses. And it's also nice to be in those combined programs because a lot of times you're admitted initially and as long as students keep those grades where they need them to be, whatever that program specifies, then they can follow right along and complete that master's degree. Other programs will have students um, apply later in their undergraduate years, um, but sometimes they are direct entry and that's kind of nice to, to kind of know that right from the start that you're going to be able to follow right through. Articulation agreements and transfer pathways. Some of our students are going to start at a two-year school. Some are gonna start at four-year schools. Um, there is no right or wrong way to do college. Um, you can be a full-time student. You can be a part-time student. You can go to school close to home. You can go to school really far away from home. There's no one way you know, that we can sit here and tell you, this is how you do college. So some of our students are gonna start in a two-year program. They're gonna save a lot of money. Um, they're going to get their feet wet, they're going to check it out, or their program, you know, that they're looking at is a two-year program, and maybe they could possibly continue on to four-year if they choose to. So a lot of the colleges, particularly here in our state, have those, those CCS and H, those community college system of New Hampshire schools, have that transferability or articulation agreement right in place. So if you start at, say, NHTI in a particular program, and say you would like to continue on to the University of New Hampshire to complete that four-year program, there might be an articulation agreement right in place saying everything I've taken at NHTI is going to transfer over to UNH and I'm going to be a junior when I get there. So you have advisors that help you to do that. They line it all up for you, make sure everything that you're taking is going to line up with what the University of New Hampshire or Plymouth or Keene or whichever school you're choosing um, is looking at and they can kind of help ensure that that transfer process is very smooth. So lots of articulation agreements and transfer pathways within our state, but also outside of our state to look at for our students. Um, test optional admission is something that a lot of students really like to discuss. Um, some of our students don't love or aren't particularly great standardized test takers. So to take an SAT or an ACT is not only stressful, but doesn't yield the results that they're hoping for. And that makes them stressed and makes them, you know, fear that they're not going to get into the colleges that they're looking for. Well, there are over a you know, 1,000 schools that are test optional, meaning that they don't require SAT or ACT test scores as part of the admission process. This year with COVID, um, or this past really whole year with COVID, um, so many schools went test optional. Almost all schools went test optional this year because really we weren't able to test our students. There were not test sites open you know, it wasn't available for our students. So a lot of the schools that have gone test optional have committed to stay test optional, at least for the next couple of years. So depending on what year you are, or your student is right now, you may find that these schools are still test optional when your student is going through the process. I think there will be some shifting, you know, certainly within that. Um, I think some schools may push that out longer and say, yep, we're going to stay test optional. Some may go back and require 
SAT or ACT scores. So we'll have to see what happens. But to view a list of all the scores that all the scores, all the schools that are test optional, you can go to fairtest.org, which is a great website. And it really literally lists all of those colleges. And there are all kinds of colleges. So it's not just one type of school. It's you know, schools that are really highly competitive to schools that are not as highly competitive. So it's a really great list of schools. There is a new term um, in the test world and um, it's called test blind. So these schools have committed to not seeing test scores at all. So WPI is our latest school that I've seen um, that has gone test blind they don't want you to send your scores. So test optional schools, you have the choice. You can send them if you feel like they are a good representation of you as a student. If they're not, you don't send them. It's up to you entirely. They'll use them or they won't use them in the process. Test blind schools won't use them at all. So there's all these different variable ways of, of um, you know, potentially reporting or not reporting your tests. But it's important to kind of be in touch with each of your schools. If you have questions about that, you're not really sure what they're asking you to do. If you're not sure if they are test optional, but still require test scores, if you want to be considered for scholarship purposes, that happens sometimes too. Um, really check the websites, get in touch with the admissions office. They'll let you know exactly what, what you need to know about each of your colleges. Never be afraid to reach out to them. Just yeah. want to add that uh, for homeschool students, some admissions departments want to see an extra essay or an extra recommendation letter. So that's really important that you uh, homeschool families take a look at what those requirements are. Uh, because you know it, it's it may be slightly different. You may have those dual enrollment classes, and now that College Board announced they're not doing the SAT two subject tests, right. there it's super important for families to otherwise yeah. show the strength of their students' um, work as homeschoolers. Right. So take a real that close is, look at that. Yeah, that's a great point, and that subject test piece is something to consider. You know, as homeschool families. Um, that used to be the piece that we were able to kind of say, okay, so yeah. take these tests and this is how it's going to show. So um, colleges are looking at different ways of doing things. So be in touch with them. You know, one school may do one thing, one school may do another thing, um, but it is, you know, make a, some type of a grid and some type of a spreadsheet so that you know exactly what they're looking for and just ask questions as you move through the process for sure. Another thing that is important um, is accessibility services and academic support. A lot of times um, students don't wanna think about academic support, particularly strong students. You know, they're thinking, well, I'm not gonna really need that on a campus. Um, most students in college actually do take advantage of academic support in one way or another, whether that's going to the writing center and having that essay looked over by an upperclassman, maybe somebody who has taken that same professor for the same course and can give you some sense of yeah, you probably don't want to say these kinds of things for this professor or, you know what, she really is a pretty big stickler. You better watch that MLA formatting that you're using there. You know, you, 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 might, you have some things that aren't quite right. Um, that can be really helpful, even for the very strongest of students on campus, or you might get that one math course that just is hanging you up a little bit. Um, and there are, you know, tutoring centers available that you can take advantage of on your campus. So do not ever feel like that's a bad thing. That's a great thing. It's a service provided by your campus. Take advantage of that. And then there are students who, you know, if they were in a public school setting, might have what's called an IEP or a 504. Um, they might have um, an ADD or they might have a, a different um, learning style, whatever it may be. And those accommodations are something that colleges can look at as well for our students and can really help students to be successful in that college setting. It's a little bit different operating from, you know, school to high school to college, how they do it, but the accessibility services offices are open to our students and they're ready to work with our students to help yeah. them to be as successful as possible. Go ahead, Michelle. I have had experience with this area, so I definitely can be a good resource to homeschool families if you have some questions about that. I'll just say that it really varies campus to campus. Sure. So if you have a student with IEP or 504, 
challenges now in your homeschool setting, maybe you had a diagnosis at some point, you're going to need a fairly current diagnosis to take with uh, to the college campus and know that each professor for each class has to have approval and they can kind of pick and choose which accommodations or modifications they'll allow. So your student really has to be good at self-advocacy. Uh, and you know it really can vary greatly school to school, what they'll even allow, what kinds of accommodations they'll accept. So it it's part it's going to be part of your homework when you get down to that decision process if it's going to be a good fit for your student. Yeah, absolutely. That is really part of the fit process. I always tell students, you know, that are in that situation that one of the visits when they go to campus and when campuses open up again to us um, is that accessibility services office. Because if you find that the type of accommodations that you're going to need to be successful can't be met on an individual campus, then that's not a fit for you. You know, you want to be successful. So we want to make sure that that's a stop along your way, just as, you know, that Olympic size swimming pool or whatever else it may be um, along the way. All right. Do we have some questions coming in at all yet? Michelle? Yes. Uh, somebody Great. asked about if schools ask more from homeschoolers, if that is even legal or not. In my experience, it is um, it's mo it's more from uh, a standpoint of they want to make sure that there's that uh, additional recommendation letter or the additional essay. And that essay may be based on whether or not you submit the ACT or SAT scores that test optional uh, component. But pretty much, I mean, especially private schools, they get to do what they want. Uh, yeah. They're a private in institution. And it's it's not the same as a K-12 environment or uh, public education that's supposed to be open, accessible to everybody. Right. Private schools can make a lot of their own decisions and terms for admission. So yeah, it's legal. Yeah, they can. And generally what they're looking for, you know, having been on that other side of the desk, reading those admission files, um, it's really important that a college admission professional understands what that student's curriculum looked like through their four years of, of high school. Mostly to be sure that they're prepared then for what's going to come to them in the fall when they start, you know, at that particular institution. And depending upon, you know, how competitive that institution is, you know, they're just going to want to make sure that that student's ready for that rigor, ready for that um, environment of competitiveness, all of those types of things. So what they probably are going to be looking for is more information to really understand what that curriculum might have looked like. And again, you know, this is something that, you know, we'll probably do again, talk about, you know, putting together a transcript for homeschool students, what things need to go on there, you know, how do you articulate what your student did to meet these particular requirements for graduation. So um, that's really important. And the, you know, the better you can do that, certainly the easier it is for that admission professional to make a decision based on everything that your student has been able to accomplish. So it's really gonna be something that they're looking for to really help them to understand that that student's prepared and ready to rock and roll. So, and again, as you go through this, if you have questions, you know, certainly, we want to be here to help you with that. So, you know, you're not doing it today, but you're going to be doing it in the years to come. So we're not going anywhere. We're going to make sure that we get these questions for you and, and help you through this process for sure. And again, that's where those appointments can come in, you know, with um, myself and, and the other counselors in the Center for College Planning. We would love to work with you through some of these questions as well. So that's a really good one. Really and great. we did a, a discussion last fall uh, that we have a recording on the Granite State Home Educators website, uh, which is granitestatehomeeducators.org. Under the videos, you'll see a discussion that we had with three different admission officers of different universities around New Hampshire. And so it was a great and really had got some very specific tips on writing that transcript for homeschoolers, not just, you know, the, the typical public school yeah. student. And so take a look at our videos in uh, on our website. So there's that might give you some idea of at least where to start with. Yeah, absolutely. And again, you know, always reach out to these colleges. They're more than willing to help you with that. 
And speaking of colleges, we want you guys to get to know these colleges in this process. You can't really make a decision about what school is going to make sense for you until you really get to know yep. these campuses. So maybe now you put together a list of, I don't know, maybe you have a list of 15, 20 schools that kind of fit some of the criteria, but we need to get that down a little bit smaller than that. Probably some schools, some schools, some students might apply to 15 colleges, um, but most are more in the eight to 10 range. Um, so we want to kind of get that list down. How do you do it? So one of the things that students can do is to attend college fairs. And I'm going to show you, um, I think I have a slide in here about um, attending virtual college fairs. If I don't, we'll make sure we get that information to you. But there right now, things are mostly virtual. Um, NIACAC and NACAC, which are the New England and the National Association of College Admission Counselors are putting on some really great virtual college fairs where students register, you sign up, they're free. Um, and then it's kind of cool. They have listings of all the colleges attending. They have different workshops that you can go to with the different representatives talking about all things college or very specifically their own campus. So there's all kinds of different workshops you can attend. And then you can meet with those college admission reps. So you kind of pop in and out to their rooms and you say, hey, I'm here, how are you doing? I have a question for you. And, and they chit chat with you and get some of your information and um, you can learn a little bit more about their colleges. So not quite the same as actually walking around a college fair and stopping at all of their tables and seeing all of the pretty pictures of their campuses, but it does work out pretty well. And it does give you that time with that college admissions representative to really get a sense of, you know, does this school have the major I'm looking for? Does this school have the activity level I'm looking for? What is it I, you know, that I'm getting from um, this college admission professional? You know, is it one that I'm going to keep on my list or is it one that I'm just finding today and I'm going to add to my list? What, it, what might it be? So college fairs can be really great. Hopefully, you know, this fall we can open them up and be live and in person. If not, we're definitely going to be doing them online again. Visiting the campus, kind of the same thing right now. Some campuses are open for minimal tours. So they might be doing tours, but you're not going in all of the buildings. So they don't, you know, want you to go in and out of all the buildings, but they might give you, you know, a tour of the campus, at least outside the buildings. Um, so you get a sense of the physical layout and can kind of get a sense of, you know, location and those types of things. Um, they all have very, very big virtual presences right now. They always have, but right now, I mean, these tours are really great. Some of them are live. Some of them um, are student led. Some of them, I mean, they're just phenomenal. They take you in and out of buildings. Um, they show you residence halls. They show you the, the dining halls. All of those things are, are in those information sessions and tours. So just take advantage of those. It's kind of nice. You can visit more than one college in a day right now. Want to add to that, um, you don't have to wait till your sophomore or junior year to do that. You know, as you said, Karen, early on, take advantage of any family trips that you may have uh, to other states to check that out. And uh, I'll, I'll say we started doing campus visits uh, even when my twins were freshmen. Uh, we took advantage of the ones in the New England area uh, when they would have them open. And it really gave them a lot more sense of what they liked yes. and were looking for. So when they got to their sophomore and junior years, they were really much more secure ahead in their decision process going into it. So, and I would also warn folks, those glossy brochures you get in the mail are, are beautiful and very alluring, but getting on campus at any opportunity that you can, I would really, really encourage it because it, it can make or break the, the experience and it can be very different. I know my kids had, um, very interesting experiences and it it either put some on the list or took some off the list so mm -hmm. it's really important for their decision process yeah it definitely is in fact um as you said you know there's never too early um my niece is a sophomore and my own daughter is a freshman and next week is april vacation for um our little new hampshire students so we are actually going to go visit a few colleges just to get an idea i told them here are some that are might have kind of some of the majors you guys are thinking of, pick some. And we're going to just go and check them out because it's not too early to get them thinking. Um, my older daughter, um, kind of later in the process, we had been looking at smaller schools 
kind of in my mind thinking maybe that's what I would look at. Um, as we were looking, she was like, hmm, these are too small. I need more room to grow than this. Mm. And I'm like, what? Oh my gosh. We had to kind of do a quick sales <laughs> spin um, and start visiting some larger campuses for her. That's where she ended up going was a larger campus and she loved it. And it was all her. My younger one probably won't look at those larger campuses, but who knows? Maybe as we start to look at schools, she will get that sense and feel like, mm, I do need more room than this or whatever it may be. Um, but that's all great if you give it plenty of time. And I think for our homeschooling students, they're not in the setting where their peers are necessarily all yapping about it, you know, all the time, which is good and bad. Um, <laughs> good in the sense of that it's not as stressful, I think, for, for some time, you know, when they're hearing so much of this, I think they get a little stressed. Um, but they're also not hearing so much of this in the sense of like, oh, I visited this great school. It's so cool. You know, hopefully they're, you know, interacting with their peers and are talking about that, but they may not just be in a classroom setting where, you know, the teacher's talking about something. So getting them on these campuses gives you that time to grow and talk about it. You get in the car afterwards and they say, yeah, I don't know. I didn't love it. You know, or they get in the car and they're like yapping and yapping and telling you all about it and how much they loved it. And then you start to look at colleges that are similar to that one and put those on the list. So um, really great experiences. Again, right now, a lot of the visiting is going to be virtual, but um, we can drive through campuses and we can check things out, you know, from afar. And for those that are open to tours, we can we can go and do those tours now. Um, meeting with admission representatives, I think is really nice for our students too. I think it gives them that person that they feel like they can contact in that office of admission if they have questions. Um, there is a person who reads New Hampshire files, you know, that's some, their job. They kind of operate regionally, college admission reps. Um, they operate regionally. So the person, you know, that reads New Hampshire files will read your student's file. And if they start to interact with that individual, it's kind of a nice relationship for that college admissions rep to know your student, but that, you know, for your student to know that rep as well. Right now they're doing virtual meetings. They really want to meet with students. Every time I'm talking to my, my friends who are college admission reps, they're like, please send me your students. I want to talk to them. I need, you know, I need to get on and see people. You know, I want to do this. Um, so they really want to interact with your students and really get to know them and really answer their questions and, and provide that support that, that our students are looking for. So take the time, do that interaction with them and, and jump on. This is the college fair slide. I wasn't sure if I had put this in here or not. Um, this just talks about the NACAC college fairs. You can see that most of the dates have gone by, um, but May 2nd is coming up. Um, again, you just register at that virtual collegefairs.org. Super cool events. You know, it's something that you can jump on. Your student doesn't have to be any particular year in high school at this point in time. They can just jump on. They can visit with some of these representatives. They can attend some of those little sessions um, and get some more information. So definitely feel free um, to go ahead and do that for, for that May 2nd date. So there is that one more date we have coming up. Um, should be great. I love doing them. I was doing them um, just out of curiosity and I, I really enjoyed them for sure. So once you've kind of, you know, narrowed down the list a little bit more, you visited some campuses, you really um, have a sense of kind of what you're looking for, you have to think about on that list of colleges to which the student is applying, you know, really balancing the list. So you don't want to have only one type of school that your student is applying to because that is one type of admission, one type of financial aid um, to be offered to your student. So they're probably going to be a pretty similar outcome. If they're good, that's good. But if they're not good, that's not good. So we want to make sure that we're balancing that list, you know, put in some public universities, put in some private universities, their financial aid operates very differently. You're going to notice that the private schools have a much higher price tag initially, whereas the public universities are going to start with a lower price tag. But that private school is generally going to be able to offer your student more money and the public school not quite as much. So they kind of even out a little bit um, in that financial aid process. So it's a really good idea to have, you know, some of each on the list. Some in-state, some out-of-state students change their mind on us. Um, and that's normal <laughs> in this process. You know, by the time they apply in the fall, by the time they get to May to make their final decision, they may decide they want to stay closer to home or they may want to branch out further. So some in-state, 
some out of state is always a good way to go as well. But balancing that list is gonna be really important. On that list, we always wanna think about a financial safety school. You know, We have to have at least one school on that list that we fair, feel more comfortable, at least as a family in affording, um, because we don't know exactly how financial aid is gonna play out for us. And we wanna make sure that you know we have a safer opportunity for our student there. Um, financial aid can be offered um, in a couple of different ways. So it's important to know how the schools to which your student is applying is offering their own aid. Federal aid is federal aid. So if you qualify for a federal Pell Grant, say money that is free money for a student to go to school, lower income families might qualify for a Pell Grant, that money is yours regardless. So you can take that to college in Pennsylvania, you can take it to college in Maine, you can stay in New Hampshire, whatever it might be. The schools themselves also have a pool of money that they're going to offer to students in terms of financial aid. And that's where they have control over how they're going to award that money to their students. So some colleges are going to offer need-based financial aid. So when you file the financial aid paperwork, the FAFSA form, based on that information, they're going to determine we don't get to determine what your need is in terms of financial aid. And based on those figures, they can award you some money from their pool. Other colleges say, you know what, we're going to offer our aid based on merit. So based on a talent or a skill that your student has, most often that's grades and test scores if they're looking at test scores. Um, but sometimes it's athletic, sometimes it's leadership skills, sometimes it's based on the major the student is looking at. But again, most often it's academic merit scholarship that we're talking about here. So some colleges are saying we're going to do that. Some say we do a little bit of both of those things. So if your student is a great, strong student and we're hoping that they might receive some academic merit scholarship, if they apply to all colleges that are just need-based, all of the Ivy League colleges are need-based, they don't offer merit scholarship, then your student is not going to get any merit scholarship money. They're only going to get need-based money. So knowing where you fall, you know, do we fall in that need category? Do we not so much fall in that need category? Might we get some merit scholarship? Then we look for colleges that have those to offer to your student. Um, one word of caution on that as well, and that kind of goes along with this slide here, is thinking about the schools on your list and how likely it is that the student will get into those schools. So if the school on the list is a probable or a target school, probable schools where, or safety schools, the students like to call them, are schools where, you know, your academic profile is better than the average 50% that get admitted to that school. So it's very likely that the student will be admitted. Target means that you're right at that middle 50% average um, in terms of admission. And again, you're likely to get admitted, but this is the world of college admissions, so we can't guarantee anything. Um, reach schools are where you don't meet that, you know, that average student in terms of being admitted to that campus. Maybe your grades are slightly lower, maybe your test scores are slightly lower, but it is a reach school. A reach school is not where a student is going to get an academic merit scholarship. So if that list consists of only reach colleges and you're hoping for academic merit scholarship, those will not be the schools that the student will receive that big academic merit scholarship because again, it's a reach school. There are other students in that category that, you know, that school fits them a little bit better in terms of the admission process. They're higher in the ranking, so to speak, and they're going to receive that merit scholarship. So just paying attention to that in terms of financial aid is going to be really important as well. A book is, I know when my kids were looking at schools, there was um, a website where they could go to determine, plug in their yeah. own information uh, to see if Absolutely. a particular school was a probable, a target or a reach. Do you Absolutely. have a website for that, I Karen? Do. The, the place that I do that with my students is bigfuture.com. It's on the College Board website. So if you have a College Board account, um, you can go onto that website and you can create a profile. And basically, it's an academic profile that just says, you know, my grades are A's and B's. Um, I have these courses or whatever it may be. And based on that information, you can kind of see where you fit 
with the requirements for those particular schools. It's really helpful in terms of putting your list together with this probable target reach category. Um, this two, two, two approach um, back in the day, you know, most of our students were applying to six to eight colleges. Now it's probably slightly more than that, um, you know, to kind of make sure we have enough financial aid offers to look at and um, enough admission offers to look at. Um, but it's the same concept. You know, we want to make sure that we don't have one category that is the only category that we're applying to, unless that's a probable category, then of course, you know, that's great. You're probably going to get into most of those schools. Um, but we don't want to just have reach schools on the list because that makes it very difficult in terms of the admission and financial aid process for sure. It's really, um, you know, a student's academic profile, again, is going to consist of your new grades, um, that you have, if you are getting grades, you know, for a homeschooling student, you're not always being graded and that's okay. Um, the colleges are very equipped to handle this. It's not a problem. Um, oftentimes the colleges even have somebody or some bodies who deal with all the homeschooling applications so that they can really very much understand exactly, you know, what that student has taken, how that works, you know, GPA is not necessary, class rank is not necessary in that process. You know, they're able to, based on what you've done and, and what, you're, what you've accomplished, they're very much able to make those admission decisions. So don't ever fear about that. There's, you know, this is what admission counselors are trained for. We are used to seeing all different kinds of um, transcripts, even from students that go to public high schools. You know, one High school might grade on a 5.0 scale and another one's on a 4.0 and one's on a 10.0. So we need to look at all the pieces for every student when they're applying. So don't fear that, you know, the college is not going to figure it out or work with you. The worst case scenario is that we give you a little call and say, can you just explain this piece to me? Because I'm not sure I totally know what such and such a course means or, you know, however it is. So, so don't fear that. Um, don't fear if they call you either. It's that's usually a good thing. They're just trying to make sure that they understand everything when they're making that admission decision for your students. So, um, yeah, this is not this is not something to worry about in terms of that process for sure. And homeschool applicants are not the rarity that you might think. Homeschooling, is, I think, especially, you know, this last year, you know, the, oh, the yeah. explosive growth of homeschooling, uh, more and more colleges are quite equipped to deal with a homeschool really really admissions. Different. So yeah. don't be afraid that your child is somehow disadvantaged by being homeschooled or that mm -hmm. the transcript is going to be some uh, unfamiliar element to the admissions office. Mm -hmm. the, they know what they're looking for. They'll be absolutely 100%. You know, back a million years ago, when I first started in admission, you know, we didn't have as many homeschooling yeah. students. So it was like, you know, we all gathered and we said, okay, now let's all look at this and do the now it's like, yep, we got this. We're good. We, we know what we're doing. We're not, you know, we have so many more students that are homeschooling and are super successful in that college setting. And we are familiar with it. We know, you know, what to be looking for. So no worries about that at all. So don't, don't fear that. Don't fear that there's like some type of tag on the, the application file. There's nothing like that. It is truly the same process. We're just reading your transcript differently than we're reading that next high school's transcript, which we are always doing because I'm always, you know, even within our state, one high school in our state is different than another high school in our state. So I have to read them differently anyway. So it's just the same, same thing. So no worries about that. Um, thinking about, you know, applying to college, you're going to have some options as a student. Um, some of our students are going to apply early in the process, so earlier in their senior year, maybe October, November, December. This is where we have that early action and early decision process taking place. Um, early action and early decision, students apply early. They hear back from their college early that they've been admitted or, or whether they've been deferred or whether they've not been admitted, they hear back early. Um, but with early decision, that's a binding contract. So if you decide that early decision is the way to go and you are admitted, that's where you're going to college. So you sign a contract as a student, mom and dad sign a contract as parents, and then a school counselor or perhaps your parent is going to be that position as well. We sign contracts just saying, yep, we understand that if our student gets admitted, we withdraw our other applications for admission at any other college, and this is where we're, we're heading. So 
that's really not for everyone. It is for some students. It absolutely is, but it's not for everyone. Early action is for more of our students. You know, that's still that early process. You hear early back from them, but it's non-binding. You have until May 1st to make a final decision. You see your financial aid awards from multiple colleges before making any decisions. You get your um, acceptances from multiple colleges before making any decisions. And then you have until that May 1st to make that final decision. So early action, definitely for more of our students than, than early decision. But again, early decision is for some of our students. Regular admission means that it's probably a little bit later in the process, usually December, really even into March. Um, those deadlines you will find, but there's a there's a fixed deadline and that's when all of those materials need to go to the college. Rolling admissions can be a little tricky. There is no fixed deadline. So students feel like, oh, I have some time. I don't need to really get those out there. Um, and sometimes that is the case, but other times it's not. It depends on the college. So that deadline, that admission is open until the class is filled. Once the class is filled, you can be the valedictorian of your class. You can be the best student in the whole wide world. Doesn't matter. If there's no space, there's no space. So rolling, I always tell students, just kind of apply to your rolling admission schools while you're applying to early action or while you're applying to regular admission schools and you should be fine. I think with our students now, it's a little bit easier than it was years ago. Parents, when maybe when we were applying to colleges and there wasn't what's called the common application where our students are gonna go online they're going to complete the common application and be able to send that to multiple colleges. We had to type or fill out those college applications. I, so it was different. Oh my goodness. I, the co so the common app that is available to homeschoolers? And yeah, they should Perfect. be able to use that. Yep. So that can take care of many of your students' choice application yeah. where you want to go. Uh, they will still have unique essays for some of the schools. They'll have maybe one main essay that goes to all of them, but each university has the ability to, to per ask for or require particular essays for their application in addition to the common app. And then of course there are universities that want their own application form and have their own process, their own login. So it really becomes a lot to keep track of. It does. Uh, it does. So, so keep that in mind. Uh, somebody asked about the benefit of early decision. I know it, it, what I've seen it is for uh, more of the student athletes who need to make a commitment early on. And, yeah. you know, it's a big hoopla kind of event, but yeah. uh, I'm sure you have more experience. No, no definitely student athletes. We will see this sometimes. We also see this at some of the more competitive colleges because some of these schools are admitting the majority of their class in an early decision pool. So if a student really wants to go to a particular institution, they may need, unfortunately, to apply early decision to be part of that pool. You know, if a school is admitting 70% of their applicants, you know, or 70% of their class in that early admission or early decision process, then really to be competitive, you might need to throw your hat in for early decision. Um, but I think the disadvantage is only having that one offer of financial aid now, you know, so you mm -hmm. see one offer of financial aid from that one school, we don't get to compare, we don't get to see what another school might have to offer. And that can be, I guess we don't know it, but it can be, um, less favorable than maybe what we want it to be sometimes. So I think early decision is something that you definitely want to discuss as a family. You definitely want to discuss with, you know, maybe even that school. Um, we can, you know, certainly discuss that with families. I think it's just a decision that you don't take super lightly because of that binding nature of that. Um, and because of that binding nature and having to withdraw those other applications, you don't necessarily know what anything else is gonna look like. So I think that can be tricky, but, but there are some advantages when a student absolutely 100% knows I want to go to this college by hook or by crook, I wanna go there. And the way to do that is in that early decision pool. You know, So that's where we're seeing our students throwing their hat in. To the game. But again, financially, it may not be the biggest advantage um, in the process, sadly. So great. Thank that. you, Karen. Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. Oops, going too far. Um, so the pieces of the application are really important to understand. So we did talk about that common application. 
where students can apply using that one online application. You can see it up there on the screen. It's just commonapp.org. So you can certainly check that out. Um, students fill in, well, a lot of information, honestly. It does take them some significant amount of time to complete that form, but then they are able to send that to any school that subscribes to that Common App. There are probably about 900 different colleges, it might be slightly more than that now, um, that use Common Applications. So a good majority of their schools might use that form. You're going to always have that stray college that needs you to fill out their own form, but you've completed the Common App now, so you know kind of what to put on that form as well. Um, everything was on that form, you know, so everything from the students' information to the parents' information, um, their activities that they're involved in, um, they do self-report their classes for senior year, so, you know, colleges will use that information as well. Um, so there's a lot of details on that, on that Common App. Students should really take their time on that, um, just as somebody who reads these. Um, abbreviations of classes, really hard for somebody who's not at your high school to understand, you know, very, take your time to put in that this was this level course. If you're taking something that should be like, maybe you enrolled in um, like a course with one of the dual enrollment course with one of the colleges here, make sure you indicate that because that's going to get a heavier weight in that review process for many of the schools. So indicate dual enrollment, DE, you know, on your, on that process. Um, when you put in your activities, list the things that you love the best first, because I'm reading those that way. I'm, I'm kind of assuming that's your most loved activity that you're putting in there first. Um, don't use abbreviations on that again, because I don't know what they mean. You know, I'm like, oh, sounds fantastic. I'm sure it's great. No idea really what you're doing. <laughs> um, take time to give a little description of what that is. Be, pay attention. It's the shortest amount of characters possible in the whole wide world, but do your best to kind of give some sense of what that is. If you need to elaborate on that, there is an additional information section on Common App. Use it. You know, I will go there and I will read all about it for students. You know, I'm not really sure what something is. I go right to additional information to see if the student gave me more information and I check that out. So um, use that to your advantage in that process for sure. So Common App is great. You're going to love Common App. The things that go with the Common Application are your high school transcripts. So again, for our homeschooling students, this is something that your parent or whoever's teaching you is going to put together. And it's something that you want to kind of keep track of as you're going through the years, you know, kind of be putting something aside, you know, what were the courses that you have engaged in, those types of things. How it looks um, is not as important as what is on there. You know, it doesn't have to be perfect and beautiful, but what is on there is, you know, going to be the most important. So what classes did a student take? What year did they take them in? Um, you know, kind of what is the rigor of that program that you've involved them in. Those types of things are things that the colleges are going to be able to use to make that determination for your student in terms of admission. So transcripts are the most important piece of this review process because of course we're admitting them to college to be academically successful. So um, they wanna make sure that they are. So that transcript is something, and again, you know, definitely visit the website so that you can take a peek at that workshop that we did, we'll continue to do workshops like that as you make your way through these years, you know, and if anything changes, we're going to make sure we keep up with you guys on that. Um, but it is really important. I, I would just add Go ahead, that, that uh, homeschoolers have to do some sort of annual assessment for our Re requirements. We get to keep the results private, but just for your own sanity <laughs> and parents, when you're starting to put these applications together, working with your kids to put the, all this information in for the applications, your annual assessments, your records of what your student did that year, if you've kept up with that for the, the years leading up to the application time, you're going to save yourself a world of time and worry and frustration if you already have have some of those notes combined. Um, I, I found that to be a, a big help instead of having to rush to do it in that crazy period of their fall senior year. I had my records and it was 
a, a lot easier for me and go, oh, yeah, I remember we did this, we had that, and we used this material. And so for your own sanity, your own annual assessments can be the foundation for this application process. Perfect. Yeah, that is perfect. The other piece is that college essay. And I think this is a piece that students really need to take advantage of. You know, it's your the place where a student kind of comes alive. We look at transcripts, we look at a lot of information, maybe some testing information, but here's where we get to know a student finally. So choosing a topic wisely is really important. Um, you wanna make sure that whatever that topic is, is something that the student is interested in, or at least can make sure that they twist it to something that they're interested in, you know, because that comes across, it truly does. If you can imagine, you know, me sitting in my, my living room or wherever I'm reading admission files that day and having to get through a number of them in a day, having to read all of those essays and them all kind of sounding like, that's not very good. Um, it really has to be unique. There are some essays that I read that I'm like, I think I know this kid. I think I want to know this kid. I'd want to be their roommate. You know, that's what you're going for. You know, whether you're writing about brushing your teeth or you're writing about skiing the Alps, I don't care really what you're writing about. It's just, would I want this student to be my roommate? Would I want this student on the campus? Is this somebody who's going to bring something with them? Um, and you don't have to bring everything. And that kind of goes with the extracurriculars. You know, do I need to be involved in a leadership activity and a student government and um, a sport and the marching band. And I also need to do some community service. No, um, do the things that you love and do them well. You know, if you have been involved with animals since you were little, you love animals. And then you started volunteering for the SPCA. Then you started doing this and then you start, you know, show that progression. Or maybe you've played soccer since you were teeny tiny and then you played for, you know, your local team and then you started coaching and then you, whatever, you know, whatever it is that your student's involved in doesn't matter as much as their passion for that involvement. Um, there are 10 spots on the Common App to list activities. You do not need to fill 10. Okay, so don't feel that pressure. Um, always heard they would rather see depth yeah. rather oh, than a, a wide variety that we're more scattered at with less time commitment over the years. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. I would rather see a student be involved in one or two really deep activities than 10. I did it for a semester and then I didn't love, you know, and, and some of that's going to happen because sure. our students don't know what they love just yet. And they're going to try other things. And that's awesome. They should try things. Um, but then they found those things and then they committed to those things and maybe they're going to continue those things in college. And that gives them a sense of that. Um, again, so it's really that quality instead of quantity that, that they're going to be looking for. Same thing in the essay. It's that, you know, that you don't have to have like a major event in your life that to write about. It can truly be very, very simple and be a great college essay because again, I got that real sense of who this student is. And, and they sound like a great kid. They sound great, you know, and somebody that's going to make a great college co-ed on the campus. So those are great things. Letters of recommendation kind of support all of those things as we're reviewing files. So letters of recommendation typically are going to come from the school counselor and from teachers. Now for homeschooling students, that's going to be a little bit different, right? Because you're not in that same type of a setting. So that's okay. That's great. That's not a problem. Um, they're going to come from potentially, again, your teacher who may be mom or dad, who may be another outside teacher that you had, or maybe you took a dual enrollment course and yeah. that professor or teacher can write a recommendation as well. It's a good idea to have probably three letters of recommendation kind of ready to go. Um, colleges will look for one, two, or three, typically, most often. And so if you have those ready to rock and roll, you're going to be just fine. But try to make sure at least one of them, probably at least two of them, are academic in nature. And then one of them is kind of like the global you. You know, how are you as a citizen of your town? Or how are you um, when you get together with your friends? How are you when you're involved in that extracurricular activity? You know, all of those pieces that somebody could write um, for you. And I don't know, Michelle, what did your students do for letters of recommendation when they were applying to school? I, my kids took a lot of outside classes. So Beautiful. that was um, uh, 
way to pull in those academic Absolutely. parts, uh, coaches, uh, yes. somebody who maybe was part of the, the, maybe if your student is doing a hands-on learning through an internship, volunteer project, especially one that had some uh, time commitment over a lengthy period of time, the, the adult who's in that supervisory role is the person that you would approach for that recommendation letter. And I, I would encourage people, your student, not you, the parent, the student to reach out to those adults to get those letters uh, lined up well in advance of those deadlines, because I have seen students uh, be denied schools because the recommendation letters weren't submitted on time. Yeah. Yeah, and we don't want that to happen for sure. Yeah. And then again, test scores are something else that are going to accompany or maybe not accompany um, that application for admission, as we were saying earlier. When does and the Common App open? Isn't it August 1? It does. And, and August that's 1st. when you, you can start looking yeah. at that, putting your information in there. And yeah. I really encourage you to have your student or you really proofread that you don't want it to have errors oh my goodness because it would only be compounded with the number of schools that yeah. get to see it and you so, also you yeah. know students you know this but I'm going to say it anyway because I get so many applications I read admission files for Northeastern so it's a highly competitive university there are students that apply to Northeastern with their common app they don't capitalize their name they don't capitalize the street that they live on. I'm like, oh my goodness, this is a problem. Um, really, this is your best work that you are sending out. So please, students, I know you're going to do it. I know you guys are. But just capitalize, punctuate, do all those things that we know you can do. Um, it just doesn't leave a great first impression. So make sure that you proofread, you proofread, you proofread. Don't mention the name of a college and if you do make sure you change it from school to school when you submit, that's not a good thing. Not yeah. a good look. We get it. I mean, yeah. we know you're applying to multiple colleges, but um, but just don't start off with that foot. So, um, yeah. you know, really important. And as Michelle was saying, you know, it, it is really important that students do start to take the lead, especially in their junior year. Um, once our students get to college, the colleges don't talk to us. They talk to our students. The, yeah. the bills come, you know, the, it goes to your students. You get the bills. Yeah. <laughs> I get the they bills. They pay them. They just won't <laughs> talk to you about them unless your student signs a release. Yeah. Um, so I think my, that was one of the things I knew. So I made sure my daughter signed that agreement right away. So I was able then to talk to a financial aid office or whatever. But yeah. if your student doesn't sign that right away, they won't talk to you. It's amazing how, how very different. But the students are going to go and they're going to live potentially on that campus or they're going to interact on that campus, even if they don't live there. So it's a good idea for them to start practicing. We don't get to follow them there. Even if we ask, I tried. Um, they don't let us. So, you know, things that students can really start to do is they could email or speak to the college admission reps. You know, they can set up a visit. They walk you literally through it. They tell, they say, okay, you know, when are you coming to visit? Oh, I'm going to, I want to be there May 2nd. Okay, great. On that day, we have tours at eight and, two, at eight and 10. Okay, which one works for you? Great. So they will literally walk your student through it. They're very pleasant. Oftentimes it's a student doing it anyway. So they're talking to another college student. Um, so it works out pretty well. And it gives that student just a little burst of confidence and then they're going to do the next piece of that so it should you know definitely be the student reaching out always must be the student filling out college applications and paperwork um, that's a legality if nothing else but you know it must be the student doing all of that um, and colleges can tell you know they're not dumb they can they can tell if this was a student completing the forms or if this was a parent completing the forms um, students can also really develop that strategy for how you're going to organize all this college stuff. You know, do they like creating folders of different colors that they're going to put all of the, you know, stuff in for one school and stuff in for another school? Do they like spreadsheets? Do they like things on their phone? How do they think is the best way, you know, for you as a family to, to get organized, listen to them, see what they think. Um, we may need to encourage, you know, some other pieces <laughs> along with their ideas and that's okay. It's all a learning process, but, um, but they can really start to develop those strategies and, and really think about that. They're going to have to do it in college when they get there. Yeah. They must check their email. Once they are applying to college, um, colleges are going to contact them by email. So many of our students don't check it. 
and we get calls in our office. Oh, we never got the financial aid award. Check the student's email. Oh, sure enough, there it is. Um, they also should check their student portal. Sometimes, you know, or most times once a student's admitted to college, somewhere down past the congratulations that we don't read past, um, at the bottom of the letter, it says, and now set up your student portal. Here's your username and a temporary password. That's kind of where everything happens then going forward. They're gonna have, you know, they're gonna ask them for any pieces of missing information. They're gonna put that financial aid award right in there. They're gonna accept their financial aid award in there. You know, so students need to do that. They need to follow up on that. They need to check it. Um, this is the time where they have to have to really start doing those types of things. And then, you know, they can, you see school counseling office here, but this is where they stay in communication with all the various offices they might be working with, whether that be admissions, whether it be you as mom and dad, who are also their teachers and their counselors and all of those things that are going forward. If they're taking courses at a college, they need to be in, in contact with those individuals because they're gonna need transcripts to be sent. So there's a lot of moving parts in this process, but it's a good idea for our students to get involved in that um, so that going forward, they're, they're ready to rock and roll. So um, once they get there, it is all them. So baby steps, you know, my daughter didn't even order a pizza, I think on her own before we got started in this. And then I said, look, you're going into the deep end, kid. We got to do this. You, you're going, I'm not, you know, I can't come with you. So you've got to learn all this stuff on your own. She did it and she does just fine now, but um, it's a learning process for them. Okay. So uh, one thing I want to do is I'm going to, um, well, let me pause for a second and see if we have any questions about the admission process before we talk real briefly about financial aid before well, with, we let you head out. With financial aid, somebody just wanted to verify if merit aid is available for the things like in the fine arts for music and art, I, yeah, you know, yeah, they're, they're available great. for any subject. It will vary school to school. It will but, vary school to school, but for a school that does have yeah. some of those performing arts or fine arts yeah. where a student is involved in an audition or a portfolio review, yeah. oftentimes there is money attached to that audition or portfolio review that your student is participating in. So this is something that is yet another step in the admission process for our yes. students who are in these, you know, very specific majors. Um, sometimes that happens really early in the fall of that senior year. And sometimes it happens later, like even into January, February, even March of the student's senior year. So it's really important to kind of be in contact with all of the individual schools to know when it happens. Um, but yes, merit money can very much be attached to those particular areas. And um, those and deadlines we, that will vary. And so as vary. you were saying, all those moving parts, staying on okay. top of it, and mm -hmm. it'll vary school to school. It so does. there's a lot to keep track of. So um, I would encourage you, if this is the path for your, your student, yes, you need them to be kind of leading the way you in the supporting role, but um, earlier, the better, <laughs> you know, it, it, it can become a, a tremendous challenge. I, I know when my kids were going through it, we treated it like it was a whole nother course yep. with the same yeah, time commitment and for yeah. that fall. It really is like a whole nother course yeah. load for your student with the essays, the applications, keeping all of these juggling parts moving properly. It, don't underestimate the time commitment it will have. Yeah, absolutely. And then when you throw auditions and things like that in there, um, a lot of times there's different audition seasons, you know, so depending on yes. what that performing art happens to be dance or music or whatever it is, you know, you might be able to do it in the fall of the senior year or in like January of the senior year. Well, you don't want to have to wait till January and do like six auditions at that time, especially if they're, you know, all over the country and it's January. So now we're dealing with snow. So, you know, you have to kind of think about that. We had calendars that we put right on the refrigerator that were just college stuff so that we could all see it, of course, color coded in crazy different colors, because that's just me. I'm a little bit of a lunatic and my daughter is also. So we had, you know, colors for admission, colors for financial aid deadlines so that we knew what we needed to be doing. Um, whatever works for you, it doesn't matter how, but like you definitely are going to need to be um, very organized. I love how you said that, Michelle, that it's almost an additional course. It really should be a course for all of our students, whether they're homeschooled, whether they're in a, a you know a traditional high school setting, whatever. Um, this is a process and it's one that 
that takes an awful lot, you know, to, to manage for our students. And, you know, you're all listening tonight. So that means that they have your support. So that's really good too. So um, we'll get them there for sure. But um, one of the pieces um, is financial aid. And this is something that I'm not going to go very heavily into because we're definitely, you know, we have done financial aid nights. We will continue to do financial aid nights where we walk you through all of the details, very, very detailed. Um, but there are a couple of things that, you know, I really would want you to understand before you, you know, kind of head out and start this process. One of those things is that there are potentially two forms that a family might have to complete in order to be eligible for financial aid. So on the left of the screen, you see FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid. It is a free form to file. Um, this is the one that everybody needs to file in order to be eligible for aid. So whether it's a two-year school, a four-year school, public, private, in-state, out-of-state, doesn't matter, big, small, they all want that FAFSA form completed in order for you to be eligible for aid. So any family that's hoping to get financial aid will complete that form. You won't complete it until the senior year though. So don't get panicked and think, oh my gosh, I need to start this right now. Unless your student is a senior, you don't. Um, it opens October 1st of the student's senior year. There are some deadlines that are earlier in the process and there are some that are later in the process. You are gonna go by the deadline driven by the schools that your student is applying to. So if they say the deadline is December 1, at one of your schools, then you need to have this done by December 1. That's just kind of how it works. If it says March 15th is your earliest deadline, then we get this done by March 15th. Whatever that school, those schools are saying, that's kind of how you go. But again, FAFSA, everyone. On the right of the screen, you see CSS profile. This is an additional form. So everybody files FAFSA. Some families are gonna file FAFSA and CSS profile. This form is one that's used by some of the private colleges to um, gather more financial information. Um, these are schools that are offering their aid in a need-based fashion. Um, so they're gathering some additional information from families. Again, they're private colleges. Typically they're the more competitive private colleges. So your student may or may not experience CSS profile. In New Hampshire, the only two schools are Dartmouth and, and um, St. Anselm that requires CSS. As we go south into Massachusetts, so you're gonna see quite a few more schools. So you're gonna have Bentley and BU and BC and uh, Northeastern, and there's quite a few that are, you know, that are certainly gonna be requiring CSS profile as you move down um, into Massachusetts. But again, if you don't need to file profile, you don't file profile, everyone files FAFSA. CSS profile has a list of schools that require that particular form up on the website. So if you go to cssprofile.org, this is a product of the college um, board. So they're the folks that do the SATs. Um, they also do CSS profile. Kind of works like SATs. You can send it to, you know, you kind of register and then you send it to the schools you need to send it to. So students or families register. It's $25 to register. $16 for every school you need to send it to after that first college. Um, so again, works a lot like those SATs when you send it off to, to multiple schools. Really different forms. Um, FAFSA is very income driven. CSS profile is very asset driven. So on FAFSA, we're not including things like our primary home. Um, that is not considered an asset on the FAFSA form. Um, our retirement funds are not considered an asset on the FAFSA form. Those are assets on CSS profile. So that's where that additional information is being gathered on that form. So um, again, you know, some of us will fill out just FAFSA. Some of us will fill out both forms um, and send those off to the appropriate colleges. It kind of works like C um, the Common App. So you fill out that one form and you can send it to multiple colleges. So we don't have to fill out one for each college. We do have to fill it out every single year though. The FAFSA gets filed every single year. Um, after that first year, it's much easier, which is nice. It's just a renewal form, um, but it is something that, you know, we do need to complete each year for our students to be eligible. It is driven by a particular tax year's information. So it's prior, prior year tax information. So for this year's seniors, they're using 2019 tax information. And the hard thing is, is that 2019 tax information may not truly be reflective of where your family's at in 2020 or 21. You know, now we're in 21 filing this form. Um, 
but we still have to use that tax information from the year that they're requiring it. There are special circumstances forms that we can complete um, to let the college know that something has changed. You know, a parent might've retired in that time, or we might've been laid off for a job during um, COVID, we might've been furloughed. Um, we might've been ill, so we were out of our job for a while. We were taking, we have un, high unreimbursed medical expenses. So there's a lot of things that aren't necessarily on that FAFSA form for us to let colleges know. And that's where families are going to be able to file a special circumstances form. And again, this is something that um, we will get very detailed into in that financial aid night, but just so you know, um, going forward and you're not, you know, these things hopefully aren't swirling around in, in your brain as you are sleeping at night, um, trying to <laughs> trying to figure out how is this gonna work? How is this gonna happen for all of us? Um, again, um, as we get closer to the time, we'll give some more detailed information, but it's really important just to understand that there are two forms. There are different sets of deadlines. FAFSA might be due at one time. CSS might be due at another time. Um, for one school, FAFSA could be earlier. For one school, it could be later. So just pay attention to all of those deadlines um, as you go through. And then the other thing about financial aid is that the individual colleges hold their own pool of money and the way that they do that is up to them. So when you're applying to schools, make sure that you're applying appropriately so that you get that aid um, or as much of that aid as, as is possible for your students. Again, this is stuff that we talk with families about all the time in our office. If it's something that you're interested in chatting with us about, let us know. Um, we can try to you know, answer some of those questions. You can give us a call anytime. Um, we get lots and lots of financial aid questions um, and admission questions in our office every day. And that's why we're there. So um, give us a ring anytime and we can get those going. And again, this is just a slide about that boot camp that I was talking about earlier and some of the webinars that we might be um, offering this summer for our families. Um, definitely keep up with us, check our website. We don't have um, a specific um, dates up just yet, but we will shortly. We're starting to work on those now as we're moving towards that summer. It's coming, guys. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll try to share that with our homeschool groups and communities so that uh, if this is of interest, plug in and um, it, NEF has so many fabulous resources and they're available for free. Yeah. So why not? You know, it's a way to put your best foot forward and to be prepared for something that otherwise can be a pretty daunting process. Absolutely. So. And, and we're not going anywhere. So just, you know, always let us know what we can do for you. So with that extensive um, chit chat that we've gone through, um, let us know if there's some questions that I can answer or, or maybe Michelle can answer um, specific to your situation or questions that you've wondered about this process. Um, we'd be happy to answer those. If you want to send those to us now, um, we can go ahead and do that. Um, and again, remember that, you know, we're not going anywhere. You know, the resources are, are still here after tonight, after we stop recording and, and close down the webinar for tonight. You know, please feel free to contact us and get in touch because um, we're happy to work with you at any point in this process. Yeah, I added uh, my general email. It's info at granitestatehomeeducators.org. And as I'm sure many of you know, I practically live on Facebook. <laughs> you can find me there anytime, yeah. practically day and night and night all the time. Uh, so you can find me there. And of course, our website has a ton of information. I've got Neef's links there in our high school and beyond section and links to our various videos that we've done so that you can get the scoop on the transcript suggestions and all of our other great events that I've done with Karen. It's been great. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, always be in touch. Um, let us know what we can do to help you. Um, don't let this process overwhelm you and don't, um, don't hesitate to reach out to the schools as well. Um, because our um, counselors here in the state and beyond are, are super great. They really want to work with our students. They really want to answer your questions as you move along through this process. So whether your student is, you know, in middle school or high school, doesn't matter. You know, just give us all a shout out and, and we, can, uh, we can help you where you are for sure. But we appreciate your taking some time. Um, to hang out with us tonight. It's been really great. Um, I really always enjoy working with Michelle. 
Um, I know that this is such a great population. And if you have suggestions also about some workshops that we can go, you know, do going forward, I would love to hear about those. Um, I am always up for a great workshop. So um, let Michelle know, let me know, and we'll see if we can't get that going for you. We Definitely. Definitely. Uh, these have been really great informational opportunities for the homeschool community. So thank you for making them available. I really appreciate it, Karen. Absolutely. So happy to be here. So good night, everybody. Thanks for taking some time with us.